I have fallen in love with the young woman again. <laughs> and sometimes I actually have to get up, get in the car and take a drive. Hello there, and welcome back to the Disc Connected. I am Ryan Verrill, and I'm here with uh, a lot of incredibly interesting people. If if it's possible, I just like to go around the room and have people share uh, your names and sort of your your history and attachment to film at the moment. Richard, can we start with you? What do you want to know? My attachment to film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your attachment to film. What you've been doing with it lately, and and just uh, who you are. So I, it's difficult for me to lead into a bio on you. I mean, you're you're a legend. Oh no, 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 no! I hope not. Uh, <laughs> that would that sounds horrible. But I understand what you mean. I understand. It was a menace compliment. Yeah. Uh, give me one question, and I'll go from there. What do you? What would you like to know, Richard? What do you think your biggest impact on the the state of film throughout the last seventy years has been? None. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I, I'm serious. What would that possibly be? Uh, Richard is from uh, West Side Story. Richard is from Twin Peaks. Richard has directed the interview and a lot of compelling pieces that I actually got some interesting questions for. Uh, anything else that you want to throw out there that, that you feel is impactful for your life that you were a part of? <laughs> Trying to get this communication together today is the biggest <laughs> thing in my life. Well, I'm grateful you were able to make it work. Well, I had nothing to do with it. I just called my friend and said, help. And so it, she's the person. Well, you're a problem solver. I mean, it takes that middleman to get it done. Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I don't know. <laughs> Ross, uh, can you explain who you are and what you've done with Richard? <laughs> you go for it, Ross. I'll, I'll try. Uh, so my name's Ross Lippman, and I'm a film restorationist and sometimes filmmaker. And I was um, honored a few years back when some friends of mine at a company called Arbolos uh, sent me a link to this film that was so crazy, they felt even they wouldn't be able to distribute it. And they thought, uh, who do you call when <laughs> you have a work that's so unusual that there's no possible chance of commercial release well they called me and i watched it and was uh the interview richard filmed the interview and i thought it was spectacular and so i got richard's contact information and reached out to him and then also uh reached out to jesse at lightbox who you'll hear from in a moment and one thing led to another and here we are today if you think the thing you saw was in, was off the wall you are in for a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Richard is still working on, an, on his new version. I think that's what he's talking about here. Interesting. We'll hear about that in a minute then. Uh, Jesse, can you tell us about Lightbox and who uh, Jesse is? Yes, uh, I'm Jesse Pyers. I'm the director and curator of Lightbox Film Center uh, at the University of the Arts. And uh, we are a uh, film exhibition space uh, that has been uh, going on at, at other locations in the, in the city of Philadelphia for uh, since the 1970s, uh, but most recently have now uh, become part of the University of the Arts. And, uh, you know, we specialize in independent film, underground film, avant-garde, you know, whatever, you know, you name rep repertory film. Uh, so, um, you know, like I said, we've, we've been... Um, uh, uh, an important resource in the city of Philadelphia for unusual films. And uh, Richard's film was, as Ross stated, uh, quite spectacular and unusual and mesmerizing and, uh, and anything else I can possibly uh, think of. And, um, and more recently we have now begun to uh, preserve films uh, with the help of, of Ross. That was an initiative that happened uh, shortly after uh, the onset of COVID. Uh, and I reached out to Ross and said, you know, let, let's let's talk about what we can do. And, and the interview was one of the first films that that uh, he mentioned to me. Wow. Interesting. Uh, well, I mean, we keep beating around the bush a little bit, Richard. Can you tell us what the interview is? 
well, first of all, it was a film that I and some friends made. I think it was, what is it, Ross, 75 or something it was for? I think the first cut was 1973, but you were, you know, shooting before then and continued working yeah. on it, obviously, yeah. Right. And it, 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 it was a film that we just, a few friends and I went to Big Sur and started doing just some fun ideas. And, and the more we shot and the more we played, the more we started finding that, that maybe this had more than just a couple shots. I mean, we went up there just to play because I'd been to Big Sur before and, I, and my friend wanted to go up there and the woman that I was living with said, let's go up and just... Uh, and people started, uh, for instance, uh, would tell us things. Uh, there was a, a cemetery, an old family cemetery on top of this hill overlooking the ocean. I mean, we were friends with people who lived there. It wasn't like the tourists. Right. And... Uh, so in that instance, oh, how can I make this coherent? <laughs> uh, I had a friend back then uh, who had a store in downtown L.A. Well, it was, it was a warehouse filled with stuff. You name it, it was there. It would be like if someone was going to make a strange movie, they would go there to get costumes and and the parts of cars and uh, just all sorts of things. And we put some things in the car and we drove to Big Sur and we started just playing. And the more we played, the more ideas started coming. And uh, it's a beautiful location we have in the film. It's just extraordinary. Hollywood had used it a lot, but we became acquainted with the people who actually owned the lap part of the land and uh, we all became friends and we all just started uh, shooting and after a while um, it, it really grew more and more and then we started doing specific things but there was no sense of we're going to go do some make a film you know it right. was we're just playing and play just got more and more serious. And at one point, I had uh, I had run out of money for the sixteen millimeter camera, so uh, I decided I wanted to finish the film anyway. So I started shooting in Super Eight. I just heard about Super Eight. I knew they weren't going to be compatible, but I was. In, I just wanted to keep playing. Right. And then uh, it, we, uh, at a certain point, after I had started editing for about a year in Super 8, I got a residual from West Side Story that allowed me to go back to 16 millimeters. So I had to take all the 16, uh, the Super 8 and, bring, and have it blown up to, super, uh, to 16 millimeter. And then sound started coming into it and then it became a, Became became very serious. <laughs> I don't know what it is about Big Sur. Um, I, I'm actually from California, and I've been to Big Sur many times. And there's something about that place that is, is special. Oh, it's just magical, yeah. It, it's way more grounding than so many other places. It, it's it's probably the confluence of, of you know the ocean and the fact that you have so much greenery around there. Well, also, there's there's only one way in and one way out. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, you either you come in one way or you can go out the other, but that there's just those two ways. Yeah, I, I've I've seen many people run out of gas on that Pacific Coast Highway <laughs> coming from there. <laughs> but it's changed a lot through the years. But yeah. back in the '60s and '70s, it was um, it was a big family more than anything. Everybody knew each other. What to tell? What's to tell you? I, one of the the interesting things is you know you you left full time acting for a little while after West Side Story and some of the other projects that you'd been doing. What what attracted you originally to that documentary filmmaking, or was it just this sense of exploration, basically? The first film I made was in Mississippi in '64. Um, it was called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and we were uh, doing. A voter registration for the 
uh, what was it called? Uh, the Democratic. Mm, it wasn't for the regular. It was. It was trying to get blacks to register to vote. Right. That was one of the things we did. And the other thing was to start community centers for anyone, but mainly blacks that didn't have anything like that. And so um, I was down there all summer. When I first arrived, there was an orientation. And after the orientation, I thought they had said that there was going to be a winter project, too. And uh, I thought, well, if I could just do some little clips, video, well, film, that uh, that would be good for the next wave of people coming down. And I mentioned it to someone who was a leader or whatever, and he said, yeah, go ahead. So I spent the summer doing voter registration and so forth and keeping away from the police um, all summer. And I had accumulated a lot of film. Yeah. Someone sent me from the camera store in L.A. I used to go to. I said, I want to make this. How do I do it? And he said, well, I'm going to send you a light meter. I'm going to send you a Bolex. And um, whatever the light meter says, repeat that same on, on the camera and goodbye and good luck. <laughs> so I shot all summer. I got back to L.A. Some people said, OK, you really got this, but now you need an editor. And they put me together with somebody and I realized that was not going to work. So I decided I was going to edit it myself. So that was the first. And again, it was the same process. I mean, I just started shooting things that I liked. Yeah. And it, it is quite a lovely film. And it's just been. Um... Did you ever see it, Jesse? Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's fantastic. Oh, so. Uh... It's the same process I did. I've done on th three feature length films now, but it's the same thing. I just kind of find my way through. In other words, there's no script. Right. I've worked with people who, whoa, who are actors, but only in a slight way, you know. Right. So anyway, that started everything. And after that, I, well, that took me into the six or to the seventies. And then that, and the film now, it's quite a bit different than what Ross put together. That was the 1975 version of the film. Right. But when I was making the interview, I had to go to London and make some money, and I made a children's film. And while I was there, my girlfriend and I, who's in the film, uh sent cassettes to each other, old Sony cassettes. So because we didn't have any money, we would send cassettes to each other and talk to each other that way. Wow. And um, after Ross got the film, I found all those cassettes that we had made to each other. that are extraordinary. The content, listening her, to her speak, everyone who's listened to the, anything I've shown them so far, they are amazed at her, her voice. It's so beautiful. And, it, and so I have a whole soundtrack that goes with the film now that wasn't there in 75. Oh, there was wow. a few things. There were a few things, granted. But this is a story now more about a love affair ups and downs in the love affair, making a film. Right in the middle of a sequence, you might hear say, Richard, for God's sakes, you didn't get the right thing, you know? <laughs> so I'm constantly weaving through the making of the film, what's in the film itself, and it's always going back and forth like that. So um, 
I'm really looking forward to showing it to my two friends. <laughs> and uh, I'm getting very close, by the way. I know you don't think so, but it has been the most difficult thing I've ever tried. It is, um, it was, it's just trying to weave in a lot of sound and trying to find enough film to cover it. That's been the trick. Uh, and and I also, to help me though, I went and I found some Super 8, a lot of Super 8 that I had never had blown up. And some of it is absolutely gorgeous, like it was shot yesterday. I mean, it is beautiful, particularly on the young woman. Yeah. Uh, the the restoration on these, has there been any, you know, significant things that uh, has, has been a major setback when you're looking at this? Or how has it, you know, stood up to the test of time? Well, the project is, is completed now. Uh, there were a lot of challenges at the time. Uh, um, not the least that uh, because Richard is, is constantly creating and he's a, a, a force of nature and he's um, been reworking the material. And that showed in the original elements of the film, which uh, had, uh, you know, some of them were deteriorating. All the existing prints were cut up because Richard had done so many variations and revisions over the years. So there was a lot of work involved there. Um, but the work absolutely, I think the film absolutely holds up. I, I really think it's stunning. And we were very happy to have just had the premiere of the 1975 version, which is the one that we restored uh, at the Rotterdam Film Festival this past January, where it was very well received. Richard, I don't even know if you know about this, but there was a review online from Mubi where they highlighted it as one of the highlights of the entire Rotterdam Film Festival this past year. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Nice. So, nice. Yeah. And anyway, so now it's uh, it's completed, but we're we're on we're now in a holding pattern because we're going to wait. And I because Richard is working on his new version, and we're I think looking forward to seeing when that comes out at it before next steps. Where Jesse can probably tell us more about that or. Yeah, let's hear about that. I mean, I, I'm fascinated to see what comes out of this because I was able to take a look at this first restoration. And I mean, some of the, the imagery is just fascinating. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to, to just share like my personal love affair with is, uh, I don't know if you keep up with modern filmmaking, but a lot of it just has this truly inorganic feel. And watching something that was filmed like this you can almost like feel the human touch that is being in every single piece of the cell. It's it's incredible. So you did see Big Sur. Yeah, I, I've seen Big Sur uh, in the film and in, in real life, and yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm jealous. I, I wish I could have seen it back then. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm excited to see uh, you know what Richard has done uh, in terms <laughs> of his his new cut. Um, but you know, as Ross said, you know he's been uh, you know working on this on and off for for many years. In fact, uh, I think you know we, I had seen a, 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 a kind of midpoint version of the film. What, what what year was that, Ross? When you guys got involved? I think How Jesse and I that? both saw a, a video edit that you had done about five or six years ago. It was the link that you had sent to Dennis Bartok, who's. Wow. Formerly with our and now with Death Crocodile. Wow. <laughs> well, you've been working on it nonstop since 1970 something, uh, you know. Uh, but there was a cut, that, a video cut that both Jesse and I saw, and uh, we were knocked out by it. As I should mention, by the way, or Jesse, we should talk about our other partners in the project. Did you want to mention them or? Uh, on, on this project? Yes, yeah, so there's the <laughs> Northeast Historic Film and National Film Preservation Foundation. Yes, of course, right. That, so, you know, as Ross mentioned, you know, the the original, or at least the most accurate version of the original cut, uh, you know, has been restored. Um, and there's also a uh, print that has been made thanks to the um, National Film Preservation Foundation uh, and and uh, Northeast Historic Film, which, which is an archive, which is which came on as a partner. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the the work that Lightbox is doing in terms of film preservation is really uh, j just uh, digital preservation. So it's nice to uh, you know, have someone step in and say, we're going to make a new print, particularly right. you know, for folks uh, who are you know, archi film archiving, uh, you know, a, a, a print 
is the is the best way to preserve a film. I mean, you know, yeah. digital preservation is kind of a short term, a short sighted uh, project. So, um, so right. Th yeah, thanks, Ross, for pointing that out. But but I you know I just want to say that um, you know seeing that film in the or that kind of mid cut that that Richard made, you know, I was intrigued and I was kind of blown away. I'd never seen anything like it. I. I, I, my uh, area of interest, it really is you know, American avant-garde film. So I had some you know, references that it, it kept bringing up, but it, but it was especially knowing Richard's work as an actor right. and then kind of having this dumped in my lap is like, wait, th this is, this isn't just, um, you know, a, a, like a side project. I mean, I, Richard talks about playing and yeah, there's a lot of play, but th this is a serious piece of work you know it, it's more than just uh you know something that you kind of bang out on the weekend um and then when we finally were able to get the the that early cut uh that that ross made um yeah it was just like wow this is a a, a virtually unseen masterpiece the, the the negative was in pretty good shape though wasn't it did the, you start uh, with? well yes and no the a and b roles were but there was the remember the mysterious c roll that was oh, falling yes. apart. That was that was in in uh, you know near near on death's doorstep, and then the mag the magnetic track was also extremely warped uh, and falling apart. So we, we it was really good that we didn't wait any longer. Uh, so yeah, so yeah. Uh, but just circling back to something Jesse said, I, I I couldn't agree more. I think Richard, you, you'll you'll probably find this humorous, but um, you know when someone says that, oh well. Richard Beamer made a film. A lot of people's first association for right or for wrong is West Side Story, and so there will be people in the you know avant garde community who might say, "Oh, well, this is just going to be a novelty," and uh, it is absolutely not. It is a very it's an astounding work. And Jesse and I have been working with the, these types of films for years, and and I mean it's it's really something. And so uh, so I think that there is you know that uh, it shatters expectations. It, it's you know it's not the side project of a Hollywood actor who suddenly discovered avant-garde film. This is somebody who's really forged his own path and 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 created a, a profound and important work. And just from the cut that I saw, I mean, it is, you can feel that again. And that's one of the things I want to ask, you know, where, when did, you've been, where, did, you, where did you see it? I got the link from Jesse. Okay. Uh, when you when you are pouring your heart and soul into this for literally decades at this point, do you how how attached do you feel to this at this point? Just personally attached because it's got to be a huge part of your life. I have fallen in love with the young woman again, <laughs> and sometimes I actually have to get up, get in the car, and take a drive wow. because what the soundtrack is doing. Well, soundtrack. What the sound is doing is just bringing everything back to life. I mean, I can I can feel the place that we lived in. Um, it's it's been a, a incredible adventure for me. This part of putting this part together, and I'm even thinking. You know, I've divided it up in four parts. I don't even know how long it is, guys. At this point, I'm guessing that each four part each part is probably a lot longer than you want it to be <laughs> i just got a feeling anyway um i had to put it in four parts because it was just getting on too wieldly uh, you know and i needed to just stick with one thing otherwise i was, was you know going way down to get something and so i was hoping my fantasy is that even before I finish the whole thing, you knowing, you know, that it's the sound, everything has to be fixed. I was just going to try to figure out how to send you a couple of the of the one and the four and the three and the two, just to let you know that um, I'm working on it all the time, <laughs> and sometimes it just gets it just uh, gets away from me. Uh, yeah. with, with, you know, decades of work put into that and it being so meaningful to you, are you discovering new things in it that maybe you, you feel like you could have left bread breadcrumbs for yourself from decades ago? Cause I imagine, you know, you're, you're falling in love again with this person and, and discovering, you know, maybe new textures in this, uh, anything that's revealed itself to you in the process over the years? Well, just everything. I mean, from the film itself to our relationship to... 
why in the world did I do that? <laughs> you know, now it's it's definitely about a love affair. Yeah. And the love affair is intertwined with the movie that's being made. And so uh, you will see. I hope. love that. <laughs> Uh, looking back at that uh, summer project documentary from '64, I mean, this is almost 60 years ago. Uh, how do you how do you look back on that now with a lot of the same things being faced in this country nowadays? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things we're still struggling with. That was a major problem back then. Oh yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone remembers, but the major thing that summer was the three boys were missing, and uh, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwarner, two guys from New York and a black guy from um, somewhere in Mississippi. And uh, they disappeared. They were a part of the... And uh, everyone knew that they were killed. I mean, this was obvious. But the, at the end of the summer, they were finally found, the three boys, under a dam. That's... It's hard to hear. It's it's also hard to hear that we are so stubborn as humans in this country that we we're not very separated from that yet yeah. In, yeah. in six decades. But it was an incredible summer of joy, and uh, the the black people that I met down there. If you see the film, um, they would say things like, you know, I've never been able to talk to a white person except to say yes sir, no sir. And we were having joyous times together. Yeah. There were some rough spots, and I almost hit one of them really hard, but I managed to get out of it. But So what do I think of the film? I really like it. And um, just recently yep. it's been, uh, you call it up when you take some old film and you make it look like it's new yeah and that's just been done to that film wow what did, was did that experience contribute I, mean, I feel like there's your your story is sort of this moment in the late 60s that you are kind of becoming disillusioned with with acting in hollywood i mean do you feel like right some of those experiences contributed to that i'm just curious no i i wasn't disillusioned i just couldn't get a job <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'll be very that, that, that in and of itself would make you one di disillusion, right? <laughs> it's going to be no. frustrating after something like West Side Story. Well, more than anything, West Side Story showed me more than anything that I didn't know enough. No. I just didn't know enough. I understand that. I mean, there's uh, being very young at that time, and then yet at the same time, you you clearly knew enough to to make some incredible choices and and capture some things on film over the next decade that was really important. Yeah, but the, the, you know, all of that just kind of happened really naturally. I mean, I, I before I I did any but went to um, Mississippi. I started doing stills when I was about 16. A friend of mine took me into a dark room and showed me things and I just fell in love. And, uh, and uh, so I was doing a lot of stills before I, uh, someone said, why are you doing this? This is, and I thought, well, it, it's just making stills, but they're moving. I just don't see the problem. So, right. uh, so that's, and I didn't see anything, of course, when we were shooting. I, you wouldn't. I could never get it developed in Mississippi. But when I came back to L.A., uh, my agent let me have a room in the office, and I sat there one night and I looked at all the rushes, and I just got up and whooped and hollered and danced around. I could not believe what was there. <laughs> it was just a thrill. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Jesse, with all of this film preservation, I, I'm curious about you just being sort of a man on the inside. What do you think is, you know, one of the most uh, dangerous aspects of, of film preservation right now? Is there something that we're on the verge of losing that lots of people that aren't on the inside wouldn't really know about? 
Yeah, I mean, and Ross could certainly speak to this as well, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm finding, well, at first I'm finding that there is this uh, groundswell, maybe, of, of people in the industry and sort of tangentially connected to the, the film industry who um, are much more concerned and much more eager to, um, you know, contribute or, or in some way to help uh, preserve films and, and kind of you know, reclaim these lost works. Um, and maybe that has something to do with the fact that we're in this weird moment of uh, this kind of golden era of streaming, if you will, where everyone, everyone assumes that, oh, well, you can, you can, you know, you can go on the internet and you can watch anything at any time and everything is available. You know, this, this kind of illusion that, that um, it's all out there when in fact it, it's really, it's like, it's disappearing even more rapidly. And, and it's, there's so many, you know, black holes and pockets, you know, where, where like, yeah. where films are just not accessible. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that that was the, you know, that was the motivation. I mean, it's funny, you know, this, this project came about a, a trustee of the university gave us a, a very generous donation and said, you know, we want you to do something with this, but there was no strings attached. Here, here is some money, please, you know, sit, sit on this idea, come back to us and explain to us what you want to do. And of course this was also, um, at the height of the COVID pandemic. So we weren't yeah. even in person doing in-person screenings. So um, perhaps that influenced my thinking, but I, but I just, I just, in my mind, I pictured all these films that I wanted to see all the films that should be seen, you know, like I could just imagine them out there and they're not, and I can't see them. I can't touch them, you know? So, so that I, I think was a big influence on, um, on wanting to do you know th this project and and like I said you know I, I I've worked with Ross over the years I know his work as a filmmaker and archivist and he I, you know I, he's a great guy uh, and just picked up the phone and said you know hey like I've got some money let's 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 talk about what we can do. I mean, awesome. Speaking to that, I was going to just say uh, Jesse, some, speaking to something you said uh, earlier, I I don't think you need to. Uh, apologize for not doing the film out work. I mean, uh, you, you, that was another component of the project and it's great that we got to do both. And, you know, in years past, I had been a film purist, which is, you know, a lot of us were back in the day, but the, the digital technology really is so good these days that there's uh, absolutely nothing to, uh, I mean, the, the experience is first rate. And also, to be honest, the art of film projection is a dying art. This might speak to one of your questions, Ryan. So you know, when you go to certainly 16 millimeter venues, there's very few in the world that can project yeah. a 16 millimeter print uh, in optimal conditions. 35, it's a little better, but even that's harder to find these days. And the digital projection is standardized. It's everywhere. I mean, I shouldn't say standards exist. It you know, varies from theater to theater. But the fact is that the the restorations that Lightbox is putting out, not just with myself, but with others, are really hold their own as they're, they're state of the art. That's what everyone is doing. You're not doing any less than anyone else is doing these days. Very few places are, st are still preserving to film, only a small handful of archives. Um, the studios are doing everything digitally. And right. so, um, so that's really where the audiences are in the digital medium. Then you get into the question of uh, theatrical versus home viewing. And I realized that Ryan, your your podcast, I think caters to home viewing. And uh, the great thing is that home viewing is capable of excellent, uh, you know, experiences yeah. these days. But that isn't always the case. You know, people are often viewing things on their laptops, on their phones. That's not the way that filmmakers want their films to be seen. In most cases, there are exceptions. But uh, so you know, for for those of you, your listeners, who make that effort to try to create a good viewing environment for these works that the filmmakers make more power to you and jesse with to you know with both your series and the exhibition series as well as the restorations where you present them properly in a theater that's that's the important work that's where that's where these films are really being seen so uh thanks to speak to you know rich about richard's film in particular you know it's it's funny when, when we first uh you know we're talking with richard and ta talking about the project um, you know, R Ross had to explain, you know, we're, we're, we want to preserve the original film as, as we mentioned that we have. And, you know, Richard was sort of like, what, what do you want with that? You know, that's, that's old news. You know, I'm, 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 I'm got, I've got new ideas. I've got new stuff. Um, let's focus on that. And, and I, 
and I think that that's both are great. And I think for, for me to speak to this, um, this notion of like the, the materiality of the film and, and, and the, you know, the sort of element of, of preservation, you know, it, it was very important for me to yeah, have, have a, as close as possible version of this film that, that screen, you know, it screened at the Whitney, it screened at other venues, you know, just to kind of have this sense of, uh, of what it was at that particular time, you know, I mean, that's, that's the true spirit of archiving. And then now we have this wonderful work that is still, you know, underway, you know, that Richard's still doing, we'll have, we'll have a great kind of um, contrast, if you will, you know, two, two, two films that are connected, but also different. I, even though I, I do discuss the home video, uh, aspect a lot. One of the things that I always try to stress is accessibility and the truth of the matter is, most of this is out of the cost range for people because they're not going to put money into you know, what they see as a dying format for the last 30 years, even though it's in some circles thriving, you could say. But uh, the the theatrical experience is still it's still magical in many places. It may not be, you know, the essence of a 60 millimeter projection in, in a lot of places or hell, it might not even be 35 millimeter in most places. But the the feeling that you can get in a place like this or a film festival where you're discovering the interview for the first time that you can feel the seventies as you're watching it. You can feel young Richard as you're watching it. It is an astonishingly different experience. <laughs> and I, you know, th that's one of the questions I guess is with, with the difference of technology advancing, I personally see one of the other problems right now is there are a lot of people that the sensibilities of the film goers have changed so much that they're not challenging themselves anymore. They're they're looking to have something that is a completely laid out experience for them. Uh, I, I mean, Richard, you've been doing this for so long. Do you feel like there's a difference between people that would go to the cinema back then and people that are, you know, maybe engrossed in film nowadays? I don't have an answer. I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. I mean, I used to go to what, we, what was known as art houses in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And and all our, you know, the Bergmans and the, the, the French New Wave and all of this. And um, I don't know. I just enjoyed, I, I, I enjoyed that world more than I did uh, Hollywood. Maybe it has something to do with what you were saying. It, it was, uh, there's something really uh, alive about it. You know, the yes. people who made those films also. Uh, they had the same feeling. Bergman, whoever goes off on an island and, and shoots a film that he's putting together and not sure where it's going, and and all of that was uh, very fascinating to me. I imagine so. Uh, is there is there anybody from the last uh, even 20, 25 years that has elicited some of those same feelings for you? I'm just thinking of one film now, but I can't tell you the director. It was called Roma. Roma. Yeah, Roma is great. And I just thought that was so such a wonderful film. So simple, but just elegant. Yeah. What? what uh, that was uh, Alfonso Cuaron, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a big deal when that came out. That, that, that touched a lot of people, I think. And that was one that that I, I, I mean I guess it's it's a Netflix it was a Netflix film or at least they they had a, a you know partial distribution yeah distribution yeah but but they or I, I don't know if it was at their insistence but there was a, there was a moment where it was like people were like you can't just stream this this needs to happen in theaters you know so they yeah. it was a theatrical rollout yeah thankfully uh, is there is there a future for some of these uh, newer cuts of the interview coming where we can hopefully see some of these in a theater around us? Well, I, we're going to we, we have a plan to, uh, you know, we have several projects now underway, uh, of, you know, film preservation projects. And, you know, our plan is to premiere them at Lightbox. Uh, some of them in the fall, hopefully, uh, you know, the, the interview, we can have a a back-to-back -back, you know one day of the the original one day of the new um and you know i i think that uh you know festival screenings are certainly something we're, we're hoping that will happen i think uh richard is invited back to rotterdam to show the, the new cut at, at some point too so uh so yeah hopefully you know this this, this we're gonna see see it 
good to hear. Uh, and, you know, speaking about the, the festivals and everything, Jesse, curious if you have any sort of, uh, you know, pattern or philosophy that you go back to for curation. Because one of the, the hardest aspects, I, I imagine, with the film preservation nowadays is simply cost. We Again, we don't have the same sensibilities we used to. We have to pick and choose what we're kind of putting our money into nowadays. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in terms of the, you know, on the exhibition side, I mean, you know, this is something I've been doing for... 20 years or so um and and lightbox existed it wasn't called lightbox back then but you know it, it started in the 1970s and, and really had this philosophy that uh you know that many kind of film societies and and um you know un underground or micro cinemas you know that have, have which is uh you know we want to show films that will you know have different perspectives that will engage audiences in different ways, show them different things. Um, and also, you know, for me, I think it's important to view cinema as a, as a language, right? And so folks who might be fluent in, in the, in the Hollywood or commercial cinema um, would do well to also learn other languages, <laughs> you know, the av avant-garde film could be a, another language, but you know, it's still, um, you know, it's still telling stories. It's still uh, it's still speaking. It's just speaking in, in different ways. Um, so that's sort of how I see film. And I, you know, I, I teach a class like you know on, on avant garde film. So I sort of do the same thing where I, you know, I talk to students who are young and maybe say, oh, you know, you, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with avant garde film, but don't be afraid. <laughs> right. it's still moving images. You're still going to be sitting in a dark room. You're going to. Uh, you know, experience a variety of emotions, maybe frustration, maybe uh, glee, and, and you know whatever comes, you know. But but it's still a cinema experience. So so being as fluent as possible in all sorts of cinema is really my my goal as a, as a curator. That, that is well said. Yeah, that's something I try to pass on as much as I can. I mean, there's there's so many people that are stuck in a lane, and when you don't challenge yourself, there's there, there's entire worlds that you're never going to discover out there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Richard, I, I would be remiss to to not hear at least one Lynch story, if you don't mind. Uh, any anything super interesting that you could pass on from working on Twin Peaks? It's a fascinating experience, I imagine, being around David Lynch, even for a couple hours at a time. Well, I mean, I've made I made a film with David in India. Yeah, did you know that? It was yeah, I, I watched some of the videos that were uh, available online on that. Yeah. Oh, little little snippets, right? Yep. Okay. Well, that's very. It, the the film is almost an hour and a half. So, I mean, I I don't know what to say about him. He's he he's he's a friend, and he's he's just um, he's like a little kid in many instances. You know, he comes out with expressions when he's excited about something. He says, "Oh, golly." Gosh, is that wonderful, you know? I mean, he's just a, a different kind of human being. As an actor, he's someone, he tells you exactly what he wants. Yeah. He's not, he's not there to say, hey, let's talk about this scene and what might be good for it. That is not a part of his vocabulary. He knows what he wants, <laughs> and he tells you what it is, and then you do it. I, I think a lot of act actors wouldn't like that because a lot of actors, particularly very famous ones, they like to add something. Or, hey, let me try this. Let me try that. Yeah. No, 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 no. No trying. No. Makes sense. Uh, Ross, with restoration work, uh, is, is there any project that you've had uh, a hand in that you feel like you're just immensely proud of the amount of restoration that you're able to complete on it? There's there's something fascinating about what people, you know, have uh, when they do restoration work and it makes such a big impact because they worked, you know, 300 hours on or something to complete that I, I love to hear how they, how they feel about those afterwards. Oh, well, you know, there's there's two levels of things. There's just, you know, the, the honor of being associated with certain great works. And then there's also, mm -hmm. you know, one likes to take pride in the, the work one has put in. Uh, I think two titles where, well, there's a lot of titles where the, I feel like the restoration would help. But uh, I was I was proud of the work that we did on uh, Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep, um, John Cassavetti's Shadows were two that I, I think uh, were able to, you know, to, to do some work that that uh, 
uh, helped the original uh, work to be seen in a more clear way. What I mean by that is in some cases, uh, particularly with lower budget films, uh, all that existed in the past were uh, not just 60 millimeter prints, but bad ones because the films, uh, the filmmakers were working with low resources, limited resources, and they only, uh, you know, the, the, any prints would have been an afterthought. The money really went into getting the thing filmed in the first place. And so they would send it off to the lab and some arch some archivists might say, oh, well, you know, your job is to replicate the, the, the old prints. And I'd say, well, what about the negative? Because, you know, if you're replicating an old print of Killer of Sheep, you're you're not representing the work of Charles Burnett. You're representing the work right. of whoever was doing the night shift at Deluxe Lab on a given night in 1973. You know, the, the original work of Charles Burnett's in the negative, and there were right. ways to print it much better. It wasn't that we were adding anything to it, but he had done some brilliant cinematography. The original prints were, you know, soft and degraded, and... Uh, likewise with the sound and so just simply by doing one's work properly it's like oh look at that you can actually see the image and hear the film <laughs> a, a classic right. example with that would be barbara loden's wanda there were some old reviews i found that said oh well no oh, the film is its authenticity is improved by the uh by the crappy way it looks i'm paraphrasing <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it just it, it adds to the authenticity and then uh i also found it a interview with Barbara Loden, who said, actually, the original camera rolls were beautiful. It was just crappy lab work. That's why the film looked that way. And we were able to bring out the original, you know, qualities of the, of the film stock. And so, so, you know, one takes pride in those things, but really it's just an honor to, to be able to work on these great films, like the interview right. and to, work, <laughs> to work with people like Richard and Jesse. <laughs> Ross, I, I I have to bring it up because he just passed, but you you worked on Kenneth Anger's films, um, and I, wow. I know that you know he he um, you know had, had made changes and 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 cuts and things like that. I, I I'm just curious. We I we had talked years ago about some of your experiences with Kenneth Anger, but I'm just curious about some of your your experience with those films. Like Rabbit's Moon and things like that. Yeah, just just curious to hear some, well, some angles. Rabbit's Moon is, is another great example. Richard, if you'll forgive us going off and talking about, you know, kind of anger for a bit. And he just passed, you know, of course, in the last couple of weeks and was just announced please, the other day. Please, please. <laughs> Talk about uh, it. <laughs> so, um, so Rabbit's Moon, he shot in 1951 on 35 millimeter nitrate film in France. Uh, but he then never was able to finish editing it until... 1971 he got the negative back and he had no money so he had reduced to 16 millimeter and had the images flip left to right as an inadvertent example or, or byproduct of the reduction process and released these blurry 16 millimeter prints well we got the original 35 millimeter nitrate and we were able to finally re restore rabbit moon from the original nitrate mm -hmm. negative and the prints were pristine and looked stunning and kenneth loved them he was so happy with them um and uh but uh and we restored the original image orientation of the photography and uh but he did want to uh, make some changes to richard interestingly enough at that time i was working with ucla and ucla you know the archives uh job is really not to help the artists make their new work uh, so, you know, again, it was a similar situation. We focused on the older version. Kenneth never did go around to making his alternate newer cut of Rabbit's Moon. But uh, in, in the case of the interview, obviously, Richard's uh, been able to go ahead and uh, and do it. And then also, interestingly enough, Lightbox is uh, not being a, a classical archive, per se, is a little bit more... Uh, is flexible and they were also able to work with Wayne Wayne on his re-edit of a film called Life is Cheap. That was another project that Jesse that Jesse did. Wayne it's, Wang's getting a lot of attention lately. There was a the restoration of uh, a few of his works and Criterion's been releasing a couple of them. It's it's been nice to see some attention given that way. But it's also it's interesting to see that you know these the new the new editions of the work by living artists coming out concurrent with the uh, the older versions and the restorations, because that was what we did with with uh, Wayne Wang's Life is Cheap too. 
Well, and as somebody who's do, that's doing it literally right now, Richard, I, I would love to hear just your philosophy on the idea of, you know, perhaps uh, archiving the original version of a film that was made while also making changes and having that available as well. And uh, it seems to be a, a, a pretty like a uh, pretty aggressive touching point for some of these people lately where they they're sad that the the version they saw perhaps growing up. They, they feel like they'll lose because somebody is changing the color grade of something or, uh, you know, going in and editing some of these scenes. Do you think that there's an obligation that a filmmaker has to, to keep things the same for the people that have experienced it? Or are you just wanting to get your vision out there as a filmmaker? Um, <clears throat> my vision out there, I, 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 I just don't know how to answer those questions. I, I don't, uh, I don't think about it that way. I mean, you know, I get up in the morning and I, and I, you know, like a painter gets up and they paint and I, it's for other people to like it or not like it. I, I, this particular version, just the way it came about, I mean, I'm really liking it. <laughs> yeah. That's good. And that, that is a way to answer. Uh, that, that's one of the, I think, important ways to answer is that for, for some, it's not something that they hold as near because when they complete it, it, it's up to you to decide if you like it or not. It's just what I did, basically. Yeah, and I, I don't see it as much as like, a, you know, George Lucas going back and, oh, you know, if I only had the, the digital technology right. to do this and, you know, oh, now I do. Now I'm going to go back. You know, I think and, you know, I'll, I don't want to speak for Richard, but, but my, my sense is that, you know, th this film in particular um, is very personal. And, and yeah. uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it's I can, as he said, like a painter, you know, it's 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 a work that is constantly evolving and uh, is, you know, Richard's a living artist and, and, and he, you know, he wants to continue to work on. It. And I, th I think that that is much more exciting to me than, than to simply say, Oh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to, you know, make exactly. silly changes because, you know, my fans want or you know, or whatever. You know? <laughs> I love that you're getting something new out of it as you're working on it as well. Uh, when, when you're done, do you think that there's any feelings that you're hoping to elicit in the, in the viewers when this starts to make the, the festival circuit? I don't care. Good. I just don't care. I mean, it's like a love affair. Some other people might like not like who you're with, but uh, I don't care. You know, I'm right. having a relationship with it that's really putting me through a lot. One of the things is, can I get this finished <laughs> <laughs> so Jesse can show it? But um, no, I, I don't think too much about that sort of stuff. I really don't. No. I mean, it's lovely to hear when, you know, you guys have been saying things about you saw this in the film and that. It's lovely to hear. I say, okay, that's that's a validation that I'm on the right track. Uh, but I ultimately, I mean, I have quite a few films and documentaries that no one's ever seen. Right. And um, I show them to friends and then I put them on the shelf. They're, you know, I go... But I don't, I really don't care what they think. Uh, I, I mean, I care about what they think about life, and they're, they're, but I don't care if they like it or not. That's not, it just doesn't make any difference to me. There was, there was two people that I really wanted the last film that I made called uh, In the Shadow of a Red Truck. And... I just wanted two people to see it because I knew they would be very honest with me. One was David, and the other one is a, a reviewer who reviewed a book that I wrote, and I just loved the way he tore it apart and put it back together again and did all wonderful things with it. He knew about literature, he knew about filmmaking, and he just piled it all in there. And it was lovely to hear. And I know both of those people would, um, you know. Apart from that, I show it to some friends, and that's kind of the end of the story.
I mean, I just don't have an audience. I would, I would, be, I would love to have an audience. I, you know, be able to sh- share something that I care about, but I don't know where that is. I mean, the the, the, uh, the film festival that Ross mentioned that seems to be an interesting place. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. Good. There, there's a lot of them out there. I'm sure that would love to see this. Uh, <laughs> well, there's just three people I care about now at this moment. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> On that note, that is a wonderful way to pull this to a close. Uh, I hope uh, when this starts making the actual festival circuit rounds that people can find a way to see this semi-locally and uh, hopefully get this into to more eyeballs out across the world. Because what I've seen so far, I, I truly love, Richard. Well, so thank you for it. L- 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 you know... As far as I'm concerned, the three of you are the beginning of an audience, you know? Yeah. You know, you see where it goes, and sometimes it takes off, and sometimes you put it back on the shelf, and, um, but, you know, there's certain paintings that I do that I really care about over the years. I'll walk by it and say, hmm, I still like that, you know? I don't want to change anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Ross would love to hear that from me, that I'm not going to change anything. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to the new. I'm looking forward to the new version. I will. I. I. I I'm just really looking forward to you two seeing it. <laughs> and, Can't wait. Um, I might even just sh- bring out part. Uh, there was four parts. Uh, you know, get part one and just send it to you and s- see what you're thinking. Love it. It'd be great. Beautiful. Uh, Ross, Jesse, Richard, this has been incredible. I love hearing all the inside stuff on this. Uh, hopefully we can get some of you back or all of you back again someday and uh, talk about it once it starts making the circuits. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> making the circuits. Wow. <laughs> Thank a... you, gentlemen. Now Thank I you. Got, now I got pressure here, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching The Disconnected. On the way out, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, that you've liked the video, and that you've copied the link to be able to share it with someone else that may appreciate this. Thank you for listening to the Disconnected Podcast. There's one big thing that you could do to help the show, and that is to leave a rating and review on the podcast service of your choice. Thank you.